Okay, we are now going to move into Caleb Dempsey. We'll present um, more information on on-site testing. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope the uh, conference has been going well for you. Um, maybe just a quick show of hands. Who's kind of familiar with uh, what it is that we do when we come out on site to uh, evaluate the surface? Any, any hands? Great, great. So at least some of you are familiar with it. So one of the things that we do um, when we come out and do a surface evaluation is we use what's called the Orno Biomechanical Surface Tester or OBST. Another show of hands, is anybody familiar with this device? Okay, just, just a few. So what is the OBST? Uh, it's often referred to as the hoof tester because uh, you know initialisms sometimes are hard to remember. And uh, this was a device that was created to replicate, rep replicate a horse's uh, front forelimb striking the surface at Gallup. And this was determined by, you know, Mick Peterson et al. Uh, to be approximately two and a half times their body weight. So in other words, when the horse is galloping across the surface, they can strike up to 2,500 pounds force or about 11.1 .1 kilonewtons. And so this was achieved by taking a 72 pound, uh, you know, mass and dropping it from about five feet um, at a slight angle and striking the surface. So we just let it drop, it hits the surface, and then we take measurements throughout this entire process. So you certainly wouldn't want to have your foot underneath uh, the OVST when you're dropping it because you're probably going to have a bad time. So what is it that we're actually measuring when we go around the surface and we're you know, striking the surface with the OBST every time. Well, we're doing load measurements. Uh, we have a triaxial load cell, so we can measure the peak uh, vertical loading. So that's the up and down. And then we're also measuring the fore and aft loading. So that's kind of like uh, the slide of the surface. We're also looking at uh, peak deceleration. So how quickly is the OBST, you know, stopping once it hits the surface. We're also taking, you know, some other measurements, like we have a position sensor, and that allows us to make sure that, you know, we're dropping from the same height because there is a difference between arenas and racetracks. Uh, but we're also going to, you know, back out velocities and then compare that with our acceleration data and then our load cell data. And, you know, everything should be basically in agreement with each other. And so, what we do is we pretty much take three drops um, on the inside racing lanes, which is typically about seven feet, and the outside racing lanes, which is 15 feet. And we do this at every eighth pole. So for a mile long track, we're taking 48 measurements. Um, you know, I, I actually kind of joke, I, I, I feel, you know, like I can relate to the horse when they go from Churchill to Pimlico to Belmont because that extra half mile at Belmont from lifting up, you know, 72 pounds from a deadlift, you know, it's kind of exhausting. So it is a nice, you know, comparison for me. Uh, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand and ask at any time. So moving on, uh, what factors influence the OVST? So when I go around and I'm doing these drops at you know, on, on your surface, you know, what has the potential for impacting the results? Well, I'm sure many of you have heard, you know, from Nick, you know, a lot is moisture content. Moisture content is so critical to the racing surface. You know, how does it influence it? Well, it acts like a lubricant between the sand particles. And what happens as a result is like, when you're going around with your harrow, or you're floating the surface, you're affecting how the surface will uh, become compacted. And as a result, if you have sand particles that are, you know, relatively pushed together or loose in a sense, you know, that's going to affect the cushioning of the surface, how much will it provide? And that ties into, you know, okay, well, what is it we need to do when we come out and do the on-site evaluation 
with the OBST, we generally prefer that the surface would be considered open. You know, you're running your harrow at your normal harrowing depths and it's ready for racing. Uh, you know, and if your moisture is not correct, you know, if you're running a hard pan layer as opposed to like the limestone base we see, you know, out on the East Coast, you know, the OBST can straight up punch through that layer. We may actually, it may act like you have, you know, more of a cushion than you really should if you're running a hard pan layer. Uh, we also have surface composition. This is generally like not as much as a factor because most of the racetracks are similar. But, you know, if you have, uh, you know, the composition influences how well those sand particles were in a, uh, interlock with each other uh, with changes in moisture content. And because of all these factors, we do consider the measurements relative. Um, you know, from one another, but we can still make these comparisons because, you know, this ideally the track is the same as it was the last time we went testing and it's the same as we go around the track. And, you know, one of my favorite uh, examples of, you know, of what we just talked about, moisture content, surface compaction and composition, you know, I'm sure most of you have at least had the chance to walk on a beach at one, beach at one point uh, in time in your life. And, you know, when you're in the water, the surface, the sand underneath your feet can feel relatively loose. But as you start walking out, um, you know, at the tide line, you feel it's a lot more compacted. And then you move out even further. Now the beach is really sandy. And so, you know, when you kind of think about it, well, we have moisture, moisture content, you know, we have saturated, we have, you know, wet, and then we have dry. Uh, we also, you know, it's not as actually nice to walk along a gravel beach versus it is a sand beach. Um, and then, you know, another example potentially could be like, you know, we've, uh, you know, I think we've all noticed like spots like on the ground where it can get really muddy and then it dries out and now it's really hard. You know, we have compaction, we have composition, and now we have moisture. And so the OBST can really pick up on those things when we're doing these drops. So here, here's an example of dropping the OBST on a turf surface. This, uh, this turf plot was actually irrigated. It had like something like two or three inches of rain. And as a result of the moisture content, it was just punching right through the turf. And you can see how difficult it was for me to actually lift it up and out of the ground. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, that's factors that can influence the OBST. And here I say that, you know, what is the purpose of the OBST? I should really be saying, what is the purpose of our on-site evaluation? One, we want to check that there's spatial consistency. One end of the track should look like the other. But we also want to be looking at the inside uh, racing lanes versus the outside. We don't want to see any differences there because then we could see what might be, you know, rail bias, you know, is the inside lane going to be faster than the outside? And is that, you know, what, what, what about the fairness of the surface? Uh, there's the temporal consistency. That is the surface over time. You know, if we test your track in spring, we want to make sure that, you know, it's the same in the fall or the previous year, um, provided no significant changes have been made, you know, have you changed what kind of equipment you're using? Um, and that kind of ties into the next one, your maintenance practices. This is something that we did at Laurel actually when they were changing the, uh, the composition. So they went over the summer and then they were having some issues in the winter and they were looking, okay, are there ways that we can use what equipment we have on hand um, that's different and then get a different result? And can we actually prove that we're improving the surface? And that's one of the things that we can use uh, is the OBST. And so we kind of like all taking these evaluations and we're working on the idea that a safe surface is a consistent surface. So with the, you know, kind of descriptions up and out of the way, you know, okay, what is the on-site report going to look like when we take the OBST data? Well, one of the things that we're going to do is provide comparisons. So we're going to be looking at, you know, the inside lanes versus the outside lanes. And then how does the surface look around? And one of the things that we use this is with a box plot. Uh, show of hands, who's familiar with box plots? Just a few. So 
you know, to, to keep it short and simple, you know, a box plot is one way that we can visually interpret the data. Uh, we have a minimum range, a maximum range, and then the data will be core tiled up um, based on that. And, you know, ideally what we'd like to see is that it's nice and squished. Uh, if you look at the bottom curve, or bottom box plots down here, you can see how this data set was, you know, is really squished. Ideally, that's what we see when we make these comparisons, you know, it's gonna be nice and tight, but, you know, that is a pretty rare uh, case. It, most of the time we actually do see, you know, a relative range. Um, in this case, you know, uh, we were seeing like 12 to about 16 kilonewtons. And so in the previous slide, I mentioned maintenance practices, how can using a piece of equipment change the surface response? Well, here we have uh, on the top plot, we have the surface was drag harrowed and they uh, they used this big uh, harrow with, uh, they weighed it down with uh, basically metal pipes and they could take those pipes off. They could slightly change the angle, um, but this was how they were maintaining the surface. And so, they were like, oh, the right, the trainers were complaining that the surface was too hard. And so what we did, we came out and we had tested the track as it was, how they'd been doing the maintenance. And then we started evaluating what other maintenance tools did they have? Well, you know, one practice is to float the track um, to help tighten it up. And we actually found that when they were floating the track, it actually provided more cushioning. You know, we, we didn't see as high as peak loads as we have before. So they floated twice, then they floated 10 times and then even provided more cushioning. And then so, all right, now we know that we can change the cushioning of the surface just by changing the piece of equipment being used. But can we take the surface and get it back to how it was? So we took out the drag arrows again, drag arrowed it twice, drag arrowed it another two times. And look, okay, if I drag arrowed it four times, I can get back and erase the floating uh, that I just did. Uh, so continuing on, you know, we looked at drag harrowing the, the track. We looked at floating with the back rakes down, doing it twice at three inches, uh, 10 times at three inches. Then we reset the track, uh, drag harrowing it four times. Oh, found out that we can float with the back rake at two and a half inches, two times, 10 times, and have the same effect as floating with the back rake at three inches. Um, and then there was another piece of equipment that's commonly referred to as the conditioner or a roller harrow. And we found that, hey, you can also use your conditioner two times at three inches and 10 times at three inches and have the same effect as floating with the back rake down. So now the track realized that they had two additional options that were not drag harrowing that could provide more cushioning of the surface. And that was helped guided by using the OBST data. Now, one of the, uh, you know, things that now they had to decide on was, you know, do I use the float with the back rake or do I use the conditioner or can I use both? And we showed that, yeah, you can use both. But, you know, one of the things that they were struggling with was that the, um, you know, as moisture content went up on the surface, that the conditioner started loading up, you know, the material is sticking to the tires and then the, the conditioner wanted to plunge. So, they had to go at a slower speed. Now that's not necessarily going to be a good idea on race days because they need to be able to get around quick. But if they're having to slow the entire track down, now they're slowing the race schedule um, down. So, you know, that was one of the ways that the OBST was used. And by using these comparisons with the box plots to help guide a maintenance practice uh, decision. So we had the comparison that I just showed you with the box plot but this will be the spatial data. And it may look scary, but this data is, is relatively easy to digest. Um, you know, quick rules of thumbs, all these little uh, black points here on the uh, plot, those are the individual uh, OBST drops. So those are three drops at each pole location. You can see that we have the seven feet pole locations and the 15 feet pole locations. And this was performed on a synthetic racetrack. Um, and ideally what we wanna see is that all of the black points fall within the blue lines. And that blue line is represented as one standard deviation. Ideally that standard deviation would be one or less. 
that's typically what we see with the consistent racetracks and across the country is most people are at about the standard deviation of one. Uh, this red line here is your average. We see that most of the racetracks fluctuate between 10 to 15 kilonewtons or uh, uh, that's about 2,500 pound force-ish, uh, which is about 11.1 uh, kilonewtons, just for general reference. Um, we can also see that, uh, you know, we, we can look at the average and the standard deviation comparison between the seven foot and the 15 foot. And here you can see that the surface average, the seven foot average and the 15 foot average was all 13.1 across the board. And we had a standard deviation of one. So we would typically say that, yeah, this track looks really consistent. Um, and then one way that we can also look at that is saying this p-value, this p-value uh, is representing of how normally distributed is the data. Uh, another way you can think about that is how evenly spread the data is. The closer to one, the more normally distributed uh, the data is, and that's that's a good sign. Uh, and moving on, just to kind of continue with some of the data that we're looking at, you know, while I said that the track was consistent, you know, we we would sit here and be like, oh well, the half pole. Uh, actually had some data points that fell outside of the blue lines, one standard deviation. And so that would kind of like raise a little bit of a flag. Not that we're concerned with it, but hey, can we explain this? And it turns out there's a, uh, you know, a horse entrance there at the half pole where the horses enter onto the track. So we're like, oh, okay, well, you know, we see a high traffic area that's not very um, uncommon uh, to see what we would call outliers in this case. Um, so we talked about, you know, evenly spreading the data, but we have uh, these blue uh, uh, bars. These bars are what's called a histogram, which is a frequency count. So how many times did I have a data point fall at, you know, at a certain number or a range of numbers? So there's a count of that. And, you know, in an ideal world, there would only be one bar, and that's because all the data would be right on this red line. But, uh, you know, that's not necessarily the case. So if the next best thing would be like, oh, the data is actually following the shape of the uh, of this black curve, which is a normal distribution curve. So if all of the plot is a little too hard to look at, the tried and true is just, you know, look at the numbers here at the bottom. I'll tell you most of what you want to know. Is the surface average uh, within, you know, 10 to 15 kilonewtons is our standard deviation one or less. Um, and, you know, is the seven foot the same as the 15 foot? So here's just another example. This is on a dirt track um, as opposed to a synthetic. You know, what do we see here? Uh, does anybody want to take a stab at, you know, what do they think based off what I described from the previous one? All right, so really, uh, you know, we would say that this track looks pretty, pretty good. You know, we have a surface average of 11.8 uh, plus or minus 0 0.9, which is that standard deviation. Most of the data falls within the blue lines. The seven foot average is actually fairly consistent with the 15 foot average. Um, overall, we have a fitted P value of 0 0.75. So that's a good sign that the data set is actually close to being normally distributed or it's evenly spread spread out. You know, uh, the 5 eighths pole here on the inside that has a turf gap entrance, uh, which helps explain those numbers. Um, we can see a number kind of reach up on the 5 eighths pole at the 15 foot. But overall, if you take the average of these data points, everything's following within one standard deviation, and that's a great sign. So we've seen some good examples, and now I'll show you some, uh, like a not so great example. Um, here we have a surface average of 14.1 plus or minus one. Well, that's a good sign. However, the seven foot looks nothing like the 15 foot. So we actually have what might be considered rail bias here. You know, the inside had less cushioning than the outside, which might mean that we could have rail bias and, you know, you might be seeing faster times on the inside, which actually was seeming to be the case uh, based off trainer's responses. You know, we have a fitted P value, which is 0 0.3. 
So that's not necessarily great, you know? So now we have an OBST data set that's pointing out something that we could be used as, uh, you know, a room for improving the surface. So we came back out actually a week later um, and they, one of the things that they did was they went in and they just actually harrowed the inside. Uh, I think it was like three or four more times than they were on the outside, just to kind of help break up the inside racing lanes. And what did we see? We saw the seven foot drop from 14.8 on average to 14.1. Uh, the third, the 15 foot, uh, you know, outs, uh, 15 foot outside racing lanes, uh, that stayed about the same at around 13.3 plus or minus 0 0.06. But we saw a big improvement. Uh, we still had some like, you know, the finish in the half pole. I was still kind of pulling up the average, but we saw that room of improvement. We saw the p-value go from 0.3 the point eight. So now we have the OBST data becoming a lot more evenly spread, especially between the two lanes. And so now they knew that, hey, I just need to keep doing this and I can do it more and we'll gradually break up, break it up and then make the surface become more uniform. So do we have any questions about the OBST uh, data in general? Great. So we talked about the OBST data, which is one way that we evaluate the surface. Um, you know, checking is one end of the racetrack the same as the other. Um, the other way that we do this is we also perform ground penetrating radar. So ground penetrating radar, it's a method used for us to look at like the subsurface of the racetrack. We can sit here and look at the cushion layer. Uh, if you have like a hard pan set up, we can have uh, what's kind of been coined by like Dennis Moore as the, uh, uh, the pad layer. And then of course you can look at the base layer. Um, and so what this does is it transmits a signal through the surface and we pick up on reflecting uh, waves off of these layers. So this is similar to like how, you know, your car's radios uh, works, you know, the radio tower broadcasts a signal and then you tune into a certain frequency. Um, you know, like 93.4, for example, um, you know, and it's, this is like what's being used on sonar. So for those of you who have gone like fishing on a boat, you know, you're sending a wave down through the water. It's going to bounce off the fish, bounce off the, the, you know, the water's floor and then come back up. Now you can see, okay, I'm at this depth and the fish are about here. So you know how long to set or how far to set your line down. Uh, and maybe a morbid fact, but this is how the FBI uh, actually can find grave sites is they use ground penetrating radar and they're able to see, you know, where spots have been dug up. Uh, another common uh, use for this is in, you know, like when the civil engineering world, uh, you know, if they're trying to locate pipes or find rebar and concrete uh, or even just inspect the concrete is, you know, is there any internal fractures, they use ground penetrating radar um, or similar, you know, practice to uh, take a look at that. So when we're using it on the racing surface, we're again sticking to, you know, the inside and outside racing lanes. Uh, we're looking for your cushion layer, your pad layer, your base layer. Uh, we have done this in the past on uh, synthetics and turfs as well. We can locate pipes. Uh, we did this at Keeneland when they ripped up the, uh, their training track to do some, uh, you know, some base repairs. Uh, we were able to help, you know, locate the pipes based off the drawings and get them marked. Um, and then they added in some more pipes and, you know, that was a good use of the radar. So we have, here is an example on the back setup of uh, the back of our um, UTVs. So we have the OVST, but we also have the radar with the survey wheel. The survey wheel turns and then that tells the radar, hey, I need to take um, a data point. Um, I didn't realize my display was swapped, sorry about that. So again, just like the OVST, uh, I won't touch into this just because we already went over it, but you know, moisture content, surface composition, surface compaction, um, those are really going to affect the overall results of the radar. Uh, you know, one of the things that I will talk, uh, touch on is that you know, as opposed to the OBST being performed on a open surface that's ready for racing, 
you know, it's a common method to roll the track to seal it up after uh, it's been done. And, or, uh, or you can float the racetrack. Uh, and we prefer, we prefer taking it over the floated or the rolled surface because it makes, uh, makes it easier to see uh, what's going on under the layers from it being a little more compacted. Uh, you know, it helps remove the air so we can get a really good picture. Um, another thing that we'll kind of touch on uh, in the next slide or two is the uh, data processing. Uh, when we pick points, we can't pick it like exactly at the edge. We can only pick in the middle layer of the reflection. Um, and we'll get to that in just a second. But, you know, moisture content, again, it just controls everything, even the measurements that we're taking. Um, you know, and you can see here that this is what's called the dielectric content. Uh, this is like the permittivity of the signal making it through the, uh, through the surface. And you can see how it changes you know, based on the type of material, but also on the moisture content of the material. So that is one thing that, uh, you know, could potentially be a factor when we do the radar. You know, if you don't have a uniform moisture content across the surface, this dielectric constant will change and that will change, you know, how we are, are recording it. So that's just another um, thing that we have to consider. So, you won't have to ever worry about seeing this in a report unless we're trying to point something out to you. Um, but this is what we see when we're going around. We're trying to find your cushion layer. We're trying to find your base layer. So we take manual measurements. We measure the dielectric constant of the surface. We plug all the numbers into the machine and then we start driving across the track, dragging the sled and the survey wheel across. And we're doing this in lane. So we typically do four to six laps to cover the inside and outside racing lanes. Um, but sometimes we'll do more or we'll do less depending on what we're currently trying to do. So here you can see each one of these points. Uh, each one of these points are handpicked, uh, not like, you know, every single one There's a that fills it out for us to a degree. But each one of these has a GPS point associated with it. Um, you know, what we ideally see is that this is nice and flat. You know, we have a solid black line going all the way across and that replicates or represents the uh, cushion layer in the example for this case. Here we have the base layer. You know, this is at about eight inches, which is about right for a synthetic racetrack. The cushion layer is about two, three inches, which is about right as well when they're going across with the Gallup Master. Um, you know, we do have some artifacts in between um, you know, like from power harrowing, you know, you still get some compacted spots that don't get fully broken up. Uh, in this example, uh, we can actually see, oh, we have a drainage pipe on the synthetic racetrack and it shows up as this U shape. Um, so, you know, just an example that, hey, we can help find drains pipes, but we can also sit here and evaluate, is your base layer nice and flat? Is your cushion layer nice and flat? So on your report, how would that actually turn, you know, this data into this? Well, again, we have a box plot, so we can compare your lanes from the inside to the outside racing lanes. And in, in this example, notice that every box plot, it's about the same width, um, you know, it's in terms of how squished it is, um, you know, and it's even across. So we had an average depth of about 2.56 plus or minus 0.21. Uh, that's in inches. So we had like a quarter inch of a um, standard deviation. Well, that's actually about as good as we can measure because if you look at the thickness of these lines, it's actually about a half inch and you can only pick in the middle. So about 0.25 inches. So that's a really good sign uh, for the radar. And then we take all that data where it's high, where it's low, and we put a color map on it. And that color map, you can kind of think of it like uh, when you're looking at the forecast for the weather and you're seeing rain, hey, is, you know, the red means that we're going to have high rain. And then, you know, with green, you know, it's going to be like medium rain. And then, of course, blue normally represents snow. But in this case, we have red representing it's shallower and then blue representing that it is deeper. And from this racetrack, we see that it's relatively uniform in color. Um, even the chute looks uh, fairly similar to the racetrack, which is a really good sign. So this would be an example of, you know, 
good cushion depth all the way, all the way around. Uh, the base layer looked very similar and then the pad thickness also looked similar. So we went across a good example. Here is kind of like a not so great example. So you can kind of notice here that the cushion layer is relatively flat, but you start looking at the base layer, which is influencing the pad in the cushion, is that we see it's dipped down and then coming back up. You know, keep going through. Okay, the cushion layer is maintaining a relatively flat line, but now we're still seeing this base layer just drop off. All right, and again, we have the cushion layer and the pad and base layer just dropping down. Um, the pad layer and the base layer is a little more undefined. Um, here we see that it's rising back up. And here we have an example of it being the pad and the base being slightly uh, underdeveloped, which can happen from, again, not having the right moisture content going around, or there could be another issue that's causing, you know, the uh, base layer and the pad layer to not uh, be falling in line with the, uh, the cushion. Uh, again, another dip going across. And so all of those screenshots were taken from the same uh, track. And what did we see uh, as a result of this? Well, we can see that the inside positions were relatively shallower than the outside position. So as we moved out off of the rail, the track was getting, the cushion was getting deeper. Um, and, you know, we went from, you know, the previous example is 0.25, now we're up to 0 0.6, which is almost twice the standard deviation uh, of what the good track looked like. And when we put that in our color map, you know, hey, we can actually sit here and see where it was really shallow along the rail and then where it was actually deeper when we moved out. And that's actually consistent with this box plot. And we would say, hey, okay, leading into the race turn, uh, you know, it's shallower. And then as we're coming out, it's uh, getting deeper. And that's one of the things that we can help point out. And so you guys can get out there and improve the track. And so maybe one way that you could fix this is by grading material from the outside into the rail and back, and then going around with the arrows to reset it up. Um, and that's one of the things that the radar can help us use uh, and point out and help you guys, you know, so between the OBST and the ground penetrating radar, you know, it tells a story. And I always like to say, I hope it's a boring story because that means nothing is going on. So uh, at this time, I would like to open it up for any questions. If anybody has general um, questions that I can potentially answer for you. Uh, are there any questions from the audience on this one? All right, thank you very much, Caleb. That was nice. No, no problem. I hope that wasn't too much. <laughs> and of course, if you ever have any questions, just reach out to us. That's what we're here for. Thank you. All right, I'll take care. All right.